You join us here today in the beautiful kitchen of Jonathan Beckett, or as he's more commonly known, Joff, uh, the CEO of Burgess, one of the biggest figures in the Supiot business, the man who has been living and breathing Supiots since 1981. But instead of a usual business conversation about how things are going, etc., we're here to talk a bit about the man himself, a bit about Joff's life and you know some of his precious memories from his uh, long career in this industry. So, Joff, first of all, thanks very much for the invite down to Burnham on Crouch. Great to have you here. Your house is beautiful. Well, thank you. Um, like I said, I think it's interesting to get to know the personalities a bit more in super yachting because we, we all get wrapped up a bit too much, I think, in the state of the industry and all that kind of thing. I think it's nice to pause occasionally and uh, just dwell a little bit on uh, the man behind the myth. <laughs> So why don't, we, why don't we start, why don't we go right back to the beginning and talk about Jonathan Beckett as a young man. Where, where did you do your growing up? So I grew up in Norfolk. Um, I had a great childhood um, growing up on the Norfolk Broads and that's where I did all my early sailing. My mum and dad were, um, were sailors, keen sailors, and they had a 20-foot day boat and we would go out sailing on the Broads with them. And then eventually I was bought my own eight foot Luxel dinghy and I was sort of pushed out into the middle of the broad and capsized it immediately and that caused a big sort of stir. But so then I was sent to a sailing school and from then, you know, I started sort of seriously sailing. You know, I guess when I got to about 10 years old, I started racing and, um, and we moved up from mirrors to uh, Enterprises Fireball and eventually, you know, competitively raced to 505. So your early, some of your earliest memories were on the water, on the broads? Absolutely. In a dinghy? Yeah, in a dinghy, um, sometimes with a bottle of Chinzano tucked into the sort of... <laughs> <laughs> and we'd tie up on the reeds, you know, and sort of have a little little drink there and then we'd set off again. And you've just come back from the broads? We've we have, yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, I've got, I've got three little girls. They're aged six, five and four. And every year we go back up to the Broads and we rent a classic uh, boat sort of built in the 1930s. And we do four or five days cruising around my old haunts and everybody sort of loves that holiday actually. It's, it's yeah. a very special time. And so when were you, how old were you when you kind of left Norfolk? And so I, I, uh, I left Norfolk, first of all, when I was 18 years old. Um, when I left school, I went and... Uh, was got a job um, on a sailing yacht in Antigua um, and I was working in the sailing school actually on one of the broads and one of the other guys working there had just come back from the Caribbean and he said if you're going to take a gap year seriously what you've got to do is fly out to Antigua get yourself a job and go sailing in the Caribbean and that's exactly what I did and it was a fairly scary moment um, you know I went to boarding school I was sort of used to being, I thought I would be fairly independent, but actually flying off for the first time, what seemed like halfway around the world and, um, you know, going knocking on the back of boats and um, trying to find a job was, was tough. And of course there was no email and there was no mobile phone, there was no way of really being in contact with home. Anyway, I, I got a job on a 55 foot Spartan and Stevens steel catch, which was the biggest boat I had ever seen at that time. And there were three crew, and I was the third crew member, and um, and it was brilliant. Loved it. What year was that, roughly? That that was in 1975. Okay. Yeah. So you did the proper dock walk. So I did the proper dock walk. Got a job, um, 55 foot catch, as I said, and then that owner, who was an American, bought a 63 foot Bertram International which was this incredibly big motor yacht with fluffy carpets and, you know, big sort of fridge freezers and that sort of thing. And, um, and we, delivered, we delivered that boat from Miami all the way down to Venezuela. And that was a great trip. There were three crew and he would join with his wife from time to time. So you but, stayed with him for a while? So I, I, was, I was in the Caribbean for about nine months. Yeah. Okay. So your, your first job was as a crew member on a boat. So you really understand what it's like to live and work on one of these. Well, uh, you know, these days you, you would class that as a very small boat. But in, in those days, it was a big yacht. Um, and yes, you know, we got dressed in uniform every morning. And, you know, we were working from seven o'clock in the morning till 
midnight or one in the morning and um, I loved it you know I loved the whole experience and um, I had no idea that that sort of yachting existed um, I did boating in England and that was proper yachting and I, I think I got the bug from there and I was determined to do something with my life with with yachting from that point on so that planted the seed as it were that you thought this is a career yeah absolutely yeah look, maybe a career working on them or did you think at that point were you thinking you selling know, or building I, I, I guess at that point I knew I wanted to do something with boats or yachts um, I probably really thought that I would end up I, I was going back to England to, to go to university I was quite a good rugby player um, and I went to to university to play rugby not to do academic work um, and I played for England University. Yeah, you got to a very good standard. Yeah, got to a good standard. Um, and I thought I would probably end up sort of building boats on the Norfolk Broads or, you know, hiring boats out on the Norfolk Broads. Um, but when I left university, I bought a, a Yachting World magazine. But Boat International didn't exist, I think, in <laughs> 1979. And I bought a Yachting World and I just wrote lots of letters in the back of... Uh, from all the adverts in the back of the magazine, flotilla companies, shoemakers, rope makers, insurers, um, and I had five replies. One reply was from a flotilla company called Mediterranean Charter Services, and one reply was from Nigel Burgess, another reply was from Halsey Marine, and one from Yachting Partners, Alex Braden. And um, Alex Braden wrote back to me and said, sorry, no jobs going here. And he's still got that letter today. Wow. Um, uh, Halsey Marine asked me to go in for a chat, job chat. Um, Nigel Burgess asked me to go and meet him for a job chat. And the flotilla company offered me a job working on a flotilla for 14 weeks over the summer. So I did the job chats with Halsey and with Nigel. I went and worked on the flotilla. And Nigel Burgess said to me, look, I'd love to employ you. You're 22 years old, but there's only me and one secretary. And until I sell another boat, I can't afford to employ a third person. So why don't you take the job with Halsey Marine, which was on offer, which was a job um, working as a yacht broker on commission only. And um, in Athens. In Athens. Yes. So off I went to Athens, um, lived there for a year on the breadline, not earning a penny, living in a tiny sort of studio apartment, didn't have enough money even to go to an island. Wow. And it was, um, you know, it was real hand-to-mouth existence. And I didn't know the difference between a, you know, a Capra Nixon or a Bernetti or a Fed chip. But it was a great learning curve. And Nigel Burge said, stay in touch, which I did. And one day I had this envelope arrive um, in the studio with a Monaco stamp on it. And he said, look, I'm coming to Greece in two weeks' time. I'll be staying in the Cavodora Hotel in Piraeus, which is still there. And um, you'll see how we used to live if you look at the Cavodora next time you go to Piraeus. And he said, I'll be in my room every day between 8 and 9 o'clock in the morning. And if you're interested in having another job chat, just come and knock on my door. So I did. And that, I knocked on his door on a Tuesday. And I had lunch with him on a Thursday. And on the Saturday, I moved to Monaco. Wow. Yeah. So you had obviously been fairly successful in Athens selling boats. No, I was useless. Absolutely <laughs> useless. Didn't sell a thing. Didn't sell a thing. Um, so, you know, odd jobs and things. But, yeah, it was, um, it was hard. Yeah. Tough. Yeah. Tough existence. Yeah. How was your Greek after a year? Ah, it's quite good, actually. Oh, I mean, yeah. it's still, still not too bad. Yeah. Yeah. And so, that, so from Athens, so from Norfolk to Antigua. Yeah to Athens or to university yeah. and to Athens yeah. and to Monaco. Correct, yeah. And so we started in Monaco on a salary of £3,000 a year, £250 a month, and I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. You know, this is the best job ever. Um, and my job was cutting out, you know, photographs from magazines. It was filling out... We, there were no computers in those days, and we had these books with these sort of ring binder books, and each boat had a card. We'd have a sailing yacht book, a motor yacht book, a charter book, dead book, live book, and we'd have to keep moving, shuffling these cards around and writing on the back the price or the change in price and change of name, that sort of thing. But there was only about 250 yachts in the world that we were interested in. Yeah, I was going to say, so even back then, but Nigel Burgess was 
focus on the big boat market. So it wasn't a, it wasn't so. So his, his sort of strap line when he first started the company in 1975, he borrowed an apartment from a friend of his and the, in Harcourt Street in London. And the apartment was above a Jamaican restaurant. So he had these lovely wafty sort of Jamaican curry smells coming up into his office. And he had rented office furniture. And one day the council wanted to come around and inspect the apartment. And he had to rent a truck and take all the office furniture out of the apartment and put the sofas back in because there was no office use in this, in this, um, no way. In this apartment. So that's how it all started. He worked there with the, just himself and his wife. Um, and then Kate Chapelier, his first secretary, Kate Bradshaw then, um, joined him in 1976. And she stayed until two years ago. So she was with the company for over 43 years. And was it, was, how many other big yacht brokers were around at the time? There was only, when I started, there was Nigel Burgess, Halsey Marine, Camper Nicholson's, um, Castle Main, and Northrop and Johnson, Fraser Yacht. And, and that was it. And each company, the largest company maybe had about eight people. And most companies, Camper Nicholson's was four or five people. Okay. So, you know, obviously tiny compared to yeah. today. And we, we, ne we didn't speak to each other. We all used to hide. We never shared any information like we do today. So, you know, if Nigel and I were in our, our un-air-conditioned un Peugeot 504 sitting in Port Vauban in Antibes and we saw Mike Ringdahl from Castlemaine pulling up, we'd like duck behind the seats because we didn't want him to see who we were or what we were doing. Yeah. Is it because there were so few yachts, everyone was yeah. chasing the same yeah. deals, so Absolutely. it was massive competition. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. And we, you know, in those days we would sell, you know, if we sold three yachts here, that would be pretty good going. And how big were these yachts you were selling? Most of the yachts, uh, I, I got my job thanks to Nigel selling a 35 metre um, Cantieri de Lavagna Admiral, a fast motor yacht, and he sold it for $2.2 million, and I think he made about $100,000 out of it. But the whole cost of running the Monaco office when I first joined was, um, was about £100,000 a year, including Nigel's salary, advertising, travel, you know, the whole, the whole thing. So it was sort of lean, mean operation back in those days. So what, what year was it when you moved to Monaco? I moved to Monaco in March 1981, okay. and I was there for two and a half years. And then Nigel asked me if I would be interested in moving to Monaco and restarting a London branch of Nigel Burgess. And he, the strap line of the company right from the very beginning was specialist with, in the singular in the sale, purchase and charter of large yachts. And when Nigel started, a large yacht was anything over about 55 feet. Mm. And we moved, when I joined, we moved the barrier from 55 to 65 to 70. And then we had a big debate about, can we really move it to 80 feet? Or will people think we're being a bit arrogant by not dealing with some of the smaller stuff? Yeah. Um, and we did, you know, we moved it. And, um, and then I went back to, to London and I worked on my own for... A couple of years, no secretary in a in an office that was about the size of this table, in Empire House in Piccadilly, which great address, yeah. and we had this sign on the door, Nigel Burgess, and occasionally a client would come and knock on the door and say, "I'm I'm looking for Nigel Burgess," and I'd be there and I'd open the door and say, "You found us. This is it." And they'd sort of look in and they'd see one small desk, you know, a folding chair for clients, a kettle on the floor, and one filing cabinet. And a telex machine, yeah. So I'm interested about what Monaco was like in 1981 as well. When you first moved there, I mean, radically different, presumably to today. Yeah, uh, I, Monaco was 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 a very interesting place then. I mean, it was it radically different. It was, um, you know, a lot of the same buildings. Of course, a lot of new buildings have gone up, but I would say it hasn't changed as much as you think it possibly as much as it should have done. Really, but yeah. Um, yeah. I just think of all the new big towers and things going on. And our office in Monaco today, where we, we employ 55 people in our Monaco office, and when I joined Nigel, we were in the same building in a studio office on the 15th floor. Um, and we've been in that building pretty much um, our whole career. We had 
one spell out for a couple of years in a different building, but then we moved back in again. So if you were, so for Nigel to send you back to London, obviously the company was doing quite well. Let's have another office in a cent, another centre of wealth, yeah. obviously. So when I moved back to London, he said, look, you know, this would be a great opportunity. You know, we'll open the, reopen the office in London. Um, you're going to have to work on your own. Um, I'll give you, uh, I'll, I'll give you 10% of the business. And then you have to buy 10% of the business, which, which I did. And I bought 10% of the business for £10,000. Um, and he gave me 10%, so I earned 20%. Um, Good investment. <laughs> and, and he said, you know, the, the London operation, including your salary, which was then £6,000, um, is, uh, is going to be £36,000 a year. And that's a lot of money that you've got to make to make this office work. Um, and I did everything. You know, I did prepare all the advertising. I did all the accounting, the VAT returns, the PAYE, paid all the bills. Um, organized my own travel. Um, and you were 22, 23? So, so then, no, I was, so I joined Nigel when I was 23, and that would have been when I was 26, I guess. Still a stage. young so, man. Yeah, young man, yeah. We used to lock the door at, at lunchtime, go and buy six first class stamps, 10 second class stamps, and um, six envelopes, and three big biros. That was, you know. <laughs> um, and can you remember the first boat you sold? Uh, I do remember the first boat that I sold on my own was um, in about, it was in 1983. It took me a couple of years to, to really get going. The first boat I sold was a boat called Secuta 2, and it was a 75 foot steel motor yacht built in Holland. And I sold it for um, £42,000 from a scrap metal dealer from Yorkshire. Um, and I sold it to an Israeli. And I remember, I think we earned two and a half thousand pounds commission out of it. And when I got back to the office, there was a bottle of champagne and a card from Nigel on my desk saying, and actually I think there was an envelope with some cash in it as well, wow. saying really well done, you know, you're sort of off the starting blocks. And is it still around the boat? I don't think it is, no. It was pretty rapey then, so. <laughs> 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 but they were the days when, you know, and the word super yacht didn't exist, of course. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the, the, a big yacht was anything over, over 70 feet. And if you went to the old port in Cannes, you'd see all these older boats built in the, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, all lined up, all available for charter. But they were, you know, slightly rusty and they, um, a lot of them were owner skipper boats. And the, the, the owners relied on receiving the charter funds so that they could repair the engine and paint the boat before the charter started. And then, of course, a few, a few things went wrong um, where the money was paid over and the boat couldn't be delivered. And, and that's when the whole industry sort of grew up and changed. Mm. I'm thinking back then, so if a, if a big boat pulled into uh, Porto Cool, that would, that would have been a, a massive moment because... Yeah. Uh, you know, 40, 50, 60 metre boat yeah. back then was obviously a significant Absolutely. boat. So, yeah. that was I mean, the two, so the biggest yachts in the world, really, in those days, there was, a, there was um, uh, La Belle Simone and there was Ultima, which um, is now called Alderea. Um, they're, so they're both 250 odd feet um, and they were huge back in the day, absolutely huge. Um, but when Rhea Rita was delivered by De Vries, um, I, it came into Monaco and everyone was, you know, saying, have you seen Rhea Rita? It's the most incredible boat. You've got to go down. And it was 52 metres, Terence Disdale design. But, um, yeah, wow. amazing. And the clients back then, where were they mainly from? Was it scattering? The clients were, you know, European, Middle East, and America, but the Americans only really started coming to the Mediterranean in the late 80s when they would start building boats and um, that, that would cross the Atlantic on their own bottom, really. Um, and that's when the Americans started to come to the Mediterranean. So in the early 80s, there were very few Americans. We had one Swiss client, funny story, we had one Swiss client who phoned up and there was a fed ship for sale um, called Kalinga. And 
I think she's still called Kalinga today. And she was being built for Benny Toda, who was the president of um, the Philippine Airlines. And he defaulted on the shipyard. And so the boat sat in Holland outside the shipyard. We advertised it for sale. And this Swiss guy phoned up and wanted to go and look at it. And I said, when do you want to go? And he said, tomorrow. So we scrabble around. We arranged the, the inspection. And then we look in the bank account. We didn't have enough money to fly from Nice to Holland. So at three o'clock in the afternoon, Nigel and I got in the car and we drove from Monaco to Holland. We got there at something like seven o'clock in the morning and went to the bathroom in the airport, shaved, put our suits on, met him, took him to the boat, took him back to the airport, and then we drove home again. Did you say, you the boat was sold? No, we, we didn't sell it, unfortunately, but you know. <laughs> there was. <laughs> Great story. <laughs> um, and so the, obviously the, uh, the success came uh, with Nigel Burgess and the company expanded. So after how many years were you, so you obviously brought more people into the London office. And so what was it like a couple of years after you joined? Was it? So, well, I, I guess, you know, personally, I, I had two lucky breaks, personal lucky breaks in my career. Um, one was um, we sold a boat called Sarah Blue. And Sarah Blue was a 42 meter Picciotti motor yacht built in Italy. And we chartered it to an English man called Harry Goodman. And Harry Goodman owned Intersun, the travel company. And it was his first foray into yachting. And he absolutely loved the boat, loved the crew. He chartered it three times and then he bought it. And he paid seven and a half million dollars for this 42 meter boat. Um, and our commission was $500,000. That massive deal for a young company. So, so that was a massive deal. We shared it with yachting partners. The yachting partners were, were involved in that deal, but it was still a big commission. Mm. Um, and then uh, we had been involved with the Fired Brothers, um, who used to own Harrods, and they had become clients of ours. In fact, they phoned up about the same Fed ship, Kalinga, a few, few years earlier. And the Fired Brothers then were involved with the Sultan of Brunei at that stage. And Khashoggi had built Nabila, 282 feet long, and was running out of cash. So he borrowed $60 million from the Sultan of Brunei, and he pledged the yacht as security against the loan. And he defaulted on the loan, and the Sultan of Brunei took the yacht. And the Fired Brothers were put in charge of trying to get the boat sold. So they came to us, you know, we were a funny little company then. We were probably no more than about six people. And, um, and they came to me because I was their contact. And I was 29 years old and we listed the boat for sale at $35 million, which, you know, no boat had ever been listed at more than $20 million previously. How old was the biller at that point? No, so she was built in 1980. Yeah. Delivered in 1980. This was 1987. So she was delivered. She was, you know, quite magnificent, obviously, when she was delivered. V virtually no maintenance over that seven-year period. Um, so she was quite run down when we took her on. We listed her for $35 million. And our mailing list was this, you know, still no computers, no word processors. And we had these A4 sheets of paper with sort of grids on. And we would... Um, Every time you found a new name, you'd just put it on the typewriter and you'd type the new name and address on it. Nothing was in alphabetical order. Well, I was going to say, I mean, how were you accessing clients back then? I mean, it, obviously there was no database. No, no such. database, no Google. So it was just people you plucked out of the newspaper or... Um, so it was as, as kind of rough and ready as that. It, it was so you, really rough and ready, yeah, yeah. So I can, and I can personally remember pulling Trump's name out of the newspaper and researching his office address, putting him on the mailing list, and that was the end of that. But so there's so, no, no GDPR concerns back then. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then, no, and then we, um, we, in those days, we probably had three or 400 people on our mailing list. And we produced these brochures for Nabila, and we put them in envelopes, and we wrote a letter, which wouldn't have been a personal letter. It would have been, you know, we might have handwritten the name in. And then we Xeroxed the labels, and we stuck the labels on, out it went. And... Um, about three days later, the phone went in the London office and I answered the phone and there was an American 
lady on the phone saying, um, you know, like to speak to Jonathan Beckett. And I said, well, you know, it's your lucky day because actually I've answered the phone. I'm, you know, the rest of the staff have left the office for the day. In fact, there weren't any other staff. But, um, and uh, she said, well, I'd like to put you through to Donald Trump. So then I spoke to Donald Trump and he said, tell me about this boat. What can you tell me about it? Is it as good as it looks in the pictures? Is it, he said, have you got more pictures? Have you got more information? Can you be with me at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning? And I just said, yes. And um, put the phone down and then we're scrabbling around looking for flights. And we used this funny travel agent called Crowhurst Travel in those days. And the only way I could get to New York was to go on the nine o'clock Concord flight. The so next yeah, morning. Concord was or 10 o'clock. It was 10 o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock Concord flight that got into New York at nine o'clock in the morning. And we paid two and a half thousand pounds for this flight, which, you know, was a huge amount of money back in those days. So got all the information, got all the, you know, I can remember being up till midnight getting all this package together and off I went um, to New York, straight in to see Trump. Uh, that he sent a car to pick me up at the airport, straight in to see Trump, and he said, did you come on Concord? And I said, oh yeah, of course I did, you know. <laughs> and uh, tell me about the boat, blah, blah, blah. And they said, how old are you? And I said, well, I'm 29 years old. And he said, well, I've got a real problem with that. You know, you really, are you really instructed to sell this boat? I'm not sure, you know, I've never done business with somebody your age before, you're a bit young to me. And I said, no, we're really instructed. And he said, well, I'd like to speak to the lawyers. And so we called the lawyers up in Switzerland and he spoke to them and he said, you know, is John Beckett and Nigel Burgess instructed? Yes, they are. He said, well, OK, I want to make you an offer of $30 million. There and then, sight unseen. And it was accepted. Wow. And um, then I went to stay in one of his hotels in New York City. And I remember getting up the next morning and going into breakfast and looking at these newspapers, you know, the New York Times and... And every newspaper, the headline on the front page was Trump buys Khashoggi's yacht or buys the jewel in the crown of yachting because he self-publicised that. Mm. And this was when Trump was on the up in the 80s. That was when Trump was on the up in the 80s, yeah. 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 And he was soon to be... <laughs> so then we managed the boat for four years for, for Donald Trump. And during that time, he had a bad period and... The boat was repossessed by Shearson Lehman, part of American Express. And I remember going out for dinner with Donald one night. We walked out of Trump Tower, turned left out of Trump Tower down Fifth Avenue. And there was this sort of um, homeless person in the street with one of the bits of cardboard um, asking for money. And Donald said to me, you see this guy, John, he's got more money than I have at the moment. You know, yeah. Wow. But he didn't, famously didn't actually use the boat that much. He, I think he even said he didn't like boats. So Don, Donald, I think, slept one night on board the boat in four years. And that was in Atlantic City. Um, and, but Ivana, his wife, and the, and the three children used the boat a lot, actually. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we published some photos of it back in the Super Yachts book yeah. a long, long time ago. In fact, yeah. Donald Trump wrote the foreword right, to yes. one of the early yeah. editions of yeah. the Super Yachts book. The photos that show it, they're, they're quite remarkable, actually. Yeah. You can find them on the website. Yeah. They, uh, it's, yeah, it's some interesting interior decor choices. Before you leave here today, I'm going to show, I've got a dugout canoe that I picked up in the Solomon Islands because Trump Princess did this world cruise in an effort to try and sell it. So Donald paid, eventually paid $29 million for it um, because we bargained over the name at the end of the day. And he got a million dollars. That's right, because there was something about it. Uh, that didn't Khashoggi stipulate the name had to couldn't Nabi be changed? Nabila was the name of Khashoggi's daughter. Yes. And at the last minute, Khashoggi said to the Sultan of Brunei, "I really want to have the name removed from the boat because okay. it's my daughter's name." And and so Trump said, "Well, you can have the name, but I want a million dollars off the price." Of course, we'd already got Trump Princess, you know, nameplates made up. <laughs> So it's probably, uh, quite, probably quite shrewd, actually. But we, we put the boat on the market for sale at $105 million. Yeah. So he... In 1990. And we did a world cruise. Thought was somebody from Japan or Hong Kong or one of those countries would buy it. So the boat went through the Panama Canal, through the Pacific. And then we did these sort of road shows in, 
you know, in Singapore, Hong Kong, in, in Tokyo, etc. And I ended up visiting the boat in the Solomon Islands and I exchanged a flashlight for a dugout canoe to one of the local people there and we still got it here. Still got it? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What, what did the boat eventually sell for? The boat sold for $25 million. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Yeah. But you, you were involved heavily in both of those deals? Yes. So that, I mean, actually for you, as a young yacht broker, yes. there's two really big deals to yes. be a part of, two massive deals. Yeah. Uh, and actually after 1987, you know, we, we learned a lot during this period. So we sold Donald Trump, uh, Trump Princess in 1987, and then in 1988 we sold him a new 128 metre motor yacht, brand new. That's new right, build. it was going to be built in, at Amels, right? It was, yeah. So Nabila was refitted at Amels, it was, they did a really good job. Trump wanted to build the biggest and the best. What was the biggest boat in the world at the time? Um, well, Lady Mora was under construction. We actually went to look at it and we spoke to the owner and he said, well, I'd want $100 million if I was going to sell it. Um, which shows you sort of what boats were costing to build in those days. Uh, and we designed this 128 metre motor yacht, which was well before its day. I think I've seen designs of that somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we've got them in the office, and he paid a deposit. He paid his signed a contract, paid first instalment, and the hull was half built, and was some of the superstructure was built. No, it wasn't. It was um, it, it was Baz Sonneveld who was, oh, okay. and then Luigi Sturchio's sort of successors basically were doing the interior. Yeah, and then he defaulted on it, and then it was a nightmare, and and we realised we'd had got too many eggs in one basket, really looking after one client and that was not helpful at all particularly when he ran out of money and so it took us a little bit of time to get ourselves back on our feet again. But for those kind of four or five years I mean Donald Trump was... Oh, I mean, it was an incredible experience I mean it was a lifetime experience yeah it really was yeah yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so when he defaulted on the 128 metre that wasn't an easy period for Nigel Burgess? It wasn't no. No. So we, we've had a few tough periods, you know, probably th I would say three tough periods in my early career, you know, where you've mortgaged your house, you've remortgaged it and you've remortgaged it again and you get up in the morning and you think, you know, I read about people like me in the newspaper, you know, and, you know, you, how's it all going to work out? Is it going to work out? Writing checks and not signing them. Um, so kind of living deal to deal. And yeah. And then suddenly, you know, like London buses, three deals come along in a row, you know. You can wait for an hour for a London bus and then three buses come along. And we did three deals in a row and that was exciting, you know, earning commissions of anything from 50,000 to 500,000. Um, and... It just provided a bit more bedrock, a bit more yeah. stability. And then in 1990. Five, we had a, probably our next really good lucky break. And we were chartering boats to uh, an Englishman called Ian McGlynn. And Ian McGlynn was the secret, silent partner, secret partner in the body shop. And he invested £5,000 and ended up being a 50% partner in the body shop. And we built six, sort of what, what is now Amels 171. Um, motor yachts, but they were called the Tigridor series back That's in right. those days. Terry's boats. Yeah, Terry's boats. I think Terry's fee was £50,000 for designing the whole boat, you know, and, and that's the first real job that we did with Terry in, back in those days, but we built six of them. Then we built a river barge and we sold the six boats, we managed them, we chartered them, so that was a really good break for us. Yeah. That's, but now Peter de Savary owns he the does. former Tigridor, Savvy, the barge yeah. that Okay. That we built at Hackvort, yeah, yeah. 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 And he's tr trying to sell it to me. <laughs> is he? <laughs> it's a lovely boat. It, it is. <laughs> so obviously, presumably one of the biggest moments in your young career was the unfortunate death of your mentor, yes. Nigel Burgess, in 1991. 1992. 1992. He was competing in the Vendée Globe. Correct. He hit some very, very heavy weather in Biscay yeah. and was lost overboard um, and unfortunately died. So what, what was that like? I mean, and that, that was a terrible period for us. Um, you know, we were all uh, building up to the race. He'd, he'd had nine months off before the race started, sort of 
practicing. He'd done the single-handed transatlantic race, done reasonably well in that. Um, there'd been some damage to the boat in terms of delamination to the hull, which it had repaired. Um, and we had a big send-off party for him in Sable alone the night before the race. And interestingly, I mean, he, he was dead against having any sort of pers insurance policies, life insurance policies, but um, he did agree to it. And after the sort of send-off dinner party, Nudge and I sat in a room and I got him to sign these two policies. Um, and I, that, I think the race started on a Sunday. On the Monday, we went back to England. And on the Tuesday, I faxed the documents off to the insurers and with a copy of the DHL sort of slip and with a copy of the cheque that for the premium. And that went off. We couriered the insurance documents off and that night he died in this terrible storm in Biscay. And wasn't the only one, of course. No, and right. he wasn't the only one. I mean, I think, I think four or five people died in the hole, including Mike Plant, who was bringing his boat over from Newport to the start of the race, and he lost his keel, and, and he died on, on the it's a delivery voyage, if you like. Um, so it, it, for us, it was, it was a very big shock. Um, obviously, tragic, uh, tragic for his family. Uh, I was very close to his family, and I still am close to his family, with two children and his wife. Um, and so that all needed very careful managing. The first call came in saying, we know he's in trouble. We picked up an EPIRB um, signal, and then there was a second EPIRB signal, and then the life raft EPIRB signal. Um, and then eventually they found the boat and they found the body. And so it was all over the sort of British news the next morning, and we had to try to keep that quiet from his children who were in school. Um, so very difficult, and then the business of course went through quite a difficult period where sharks were out trying to buy us for, um, you know, they thought we'd be in trouble. And we made an offer to buy his family out of the business and they gave us payment terms over, I think, two years. Um, and we were lucky enough that we, we managed to do that. So suddenly here you were, a young man, at the head of a business. So there, we were seven, I think we were seven people when he died. Um, and interestingly, well, Kate, Kate Chappelle, who's just retired, but Rupert Nelson was with us, Bridget Richmond, my secretary, was with us, Mark Binney was with us. So four or five of us, of the seven, are still there today, yeah. Um, but yes, it was, it was a big thing to sort of take on. And do you think the kind of the, the, the culture Nigel instilled in the company early on is still lives on in absolutely you know when when I first joined Nigel, you were not allowed to use a blue pen, you could only write with a black pen or a red pen, depending on what it was you were writing. you couldn't write with a pencil, you couldn't write write on the reverse side of a piece of paper. you, know, you always had to wear a, a white shirt and a tie when you went to the office. And, uh, you know, jacket and tie was, was the name of the game. Didn't matter how hot it was that, was, that was what you wore. And I think he was a very pedant, pedantic, pedant, uh, meticulous, not pedantic, but very meticulous man. Everything had to be done in a certain way. You know, if you went out and you bought a cup of coffee and you didn't have a receipt, you wouldn't get re refunded. Um, I remember losing the lens cap of the office camera one day and it cost me one franc to replace it. He said, you know, I'm not reimbursing you because you have to learn about respecting office equipment. And, and you know, it was a great way to learn the, the detail, the way, the way you wrote things, the way you presented things, everything had to be just right. Um, yeah, so it was a kind of a care and a quality. Absolutely. And a particularness and an yeah. attention to detail. Yeah. Saturday mornings, we worked every Saturday morning and Saturday mornings was the time we pulled the shutters down in the office and we had a little photographic studio and we would develop the photographs that we'd taken from the previous week from driving around the ports and we had our own photographs that we would stick onto the specifications um, and most of them were sort of photographs taken from the stern of a yacht because you couldn't get a, get a very good angle so it was actually quite difficult to see 
what these boats look like from the photograph on the front of the spec. But and, and that was often you driving around? That was me. That was me on a Thursday driving around. Taking photos. Scanner. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. How things have changed. And of course, there are no mobile phones, so we'd, we'd have a, a bag full of coins. It would be, um, you know, one franc and five franc coins, and you'd stop at a pay phone, and Nigel would be on the phone to a client, and my job was putting the coins in the, in the pay phone as he was speaking to the client, yeah. Fantastic. Um, and so presumably, you know, were Nigel still around, if he was looking down, he'd look at the company that became Burgess, that still carries his name, and he'd be incredibly proud, presumably, to see. Well, I, think, I would hope so. Um, you know, we, I worked with Nigel for 12 years, so, you know, we, we were very close. And, and you would hope that he would be proud. And he, I mean, his, his family still have a 4% shareholding in the business, which is, which is very nice. So, you know, we see them once, twice, three times a year. And a couple of Nigel's very close friends, um, I have an annual lunch with them. And of course, you know, they're, they've taken a great interest to see how the business has grown and developed. And so hopefully he would be proud, yeah. Yeah, I think so. And so w when was the real, was there a period, do you remember, after Nigel's death when, we, we, we talked about this kind of, you got a kind of little three buses came along at once kind of deals. It was a period of massive acceleration when more money came into the market, more boats were being built. Was that kind of, uh, the 90s were quite a yeah. growth period, obviously, for the... And I, I think one of, one of the things that changed in our market was probably central agency listings, both, both for charter and for, for sale. And they sort of didn't exist when, when I started. And then people got closer. You know, we, we, I guess we learned that it's more about relationships with the owners or, or the clients than it is about the yachts themselves. And we had quite a big drive on trying to sort of build these relationships with some of the yacht owners. And then we got their yachts to charter and yachts to sell. And I think that was a big turning point, not just for us, but for the whole industry in terms of mm. the way it operates. And that's when you had this sort of, you know, although we're, there's a lot of competition in the marketplace today, you know, we're all colleagues as well because we rely on doing joint deals together. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There has to be a level of collegiality yeah. between all the yeah. companies or yeah. else it doesn't function. Yeah. So it couldn't be like in the old days when you would be ducking down in your Peugeot. Absolutely not, no, no. <laughs> and people would ask for details, you know, and you'd sort of, you know, you'd slow the whole process down, you know, <laughs> not send the details, just in case you were in contact with the same buyer, you know. Yeah. yeah. And so what, apart from obviously we've, we've discussed uh, Mr. Trump, uh, what, what were the other, some of the really memorable deals that you've been involved with? I think, um, you know, we've been lucky that we've been involved in some, some incredible deals in my career. Um, probably the selling of what was Platinum, which is now Dubai. Um, Andrew Winch Design and Andrew and I sort of worked on that. And it was a Lurton Blom and, Blom and Voss consortium. Um, again, Brunei, we got involved through the Brunei connection. And the, Prince Jeffrey had, was building the boat. Um, Brunei got into trouble. Arthur Anderson went into the country and basically ran the country mm. for a period of time. And we were retained to sell the project. And we did eventually sell it to Sheikh Mohammed. Uh, and then, so that, that was a you know, massive boat, massive deal. But then there was a big scare about will VAT be due if it sold in the EU. So then we had to rent the world's largest dock ship, bring it to Hamburg and put the half-built boat on the, with all the bits and pieces and sail to Norway. And we actually closed the sale in, in Norway. Wow. Yeah. So obviously, you know, selling boats like Maltese Falcon back in those days, you know, very iconic boat and um, great deal to be involved with. Well, yeah, absolutely. One of the most recognisable yeah. boats. It's one of that kind of handful, isn't it, yeah. that people just can identify absolutely. on yeah. the horizon. And the building of, you know, the building of boats like, you know, Dilbar and Azam. Um, you know, we're very privileged and, you know, it's been a great experience being involved intimately in, in those projects. Mm. 
And the people behind them are fascinating individuals. Totally. In yeah. themselves. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I met some incredible people in my career. And sometimes you have to pinch yourself, you know, when you come out of a meeting and, you know, you've just been with, you know, a prince or, you know, a businessman who's a household name. And um, I was once on board a boat, actually, and uh, I was sitting there having a cup of coffee and I saw somebody wandering over from behind me and I didn't pay much attention. But it, as he came across, he said, said, good morning, I'm Tom Cruise. I said, oh, good morning, I'm Jonathan Beckett. <laughs> Didn't try and sell him a vote. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> uh, yeah, but it, I mean, it is kind of a rarefied world, isn't it? I mean, you kind of, before, you, you know, behind, behind, behind some of these doors are some really, really fascinating people. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering about the owners. Have they, have they changed or their interactions with the brokerage community, have they changed over the years? I think so. I think, you know, back in the early days, um, for, first it was quite difficult to work out you know, if, if they were already a yacht owner, then obviously you knew who they were. And, but if they were a client looking to buy, it would sometimes be quite difficult to sort of qualify them. Whereas now it's, it's very straightforward and very easy to, yeah, to qualify a client. Um, but, you know, have they changed? I think what has changed, I used to be very scared, you know, about, of, of most clients. And I think that stood me in good stead. And I say that to a lot of our young brokers actually, you know, it's good to be have a little bit of fear and, and to make sure you prepare yourself really well for the meeting. Um, I, I did a meeting just recently and it was a boat, it was with an owner whose boat we have for sale, but we also manage the boat. And, you know, before I go into any meeting with an owner like that, I would send an email around the group just saying, can, what can you tell me what's been happening? And, and I'll get a little sort of bullet point list from each department. And, you know, when you go in and you sit in front of the owner and you sort of just exchanging some pleasantries and then you say, you know, I'm really sorry to hear about the stewardess last week. And, and you know, the owner said, that's incredible. You've got that level of detail. But, you know, and that just puts you on the front foot, not on the back foot. Yeah. yeah. Um, and as you get older, I think it gets easier to deal with the owners because they realise you've been around the boy, boys a few times and you should know what you're talking about. And is that what that still gives you the most joy in, in the business? Is it that interaction, the personal connection with the owners? Yeah, I, I mean, for me, that's my, I guess that's my speciality, the, this whole relationship sort of, um, you know, the, I enjoy that and apparently I'm reasonably good at it. So, you know, that, that gives me a lot of uh, satisfaction and pleasure. Um, doing a good job for somebody, I think, is whether they say thank you or not doesn't really matter but the fact you've done the very best job that you possibly can for someone I think that is very satisfying um, and now you know going forwards you know there's a whole new generation coming in at Burgess and that's exciting and you know this sort of we're working on a very careful hand down of clients and responsibilities to the next generation but you know seeing these younger people coming in and doing their own deals and building their own relationships. And I think for me going forwards, you know, in let's say in five years time, that will be a great pleasure and a great joy to me to see this next generation really sort of taking the bull by the horns and, and you know, yeah. and really knowing their stuff. Um, it's not only a challenge for Burgess, it's a challenge for a number of businesses in this absolutely. industry because yeah. figures like you who have basically been ground floor now top floor effectively, it's hard when you have that mm. level of knowledge and that number of contacts for that to mm. filter down, because obviously the top guys want to talk to the top guys. Yeah. But I, th I think we're doing it, you know, we're doing it well, and, you know, I would always attend, you know, uh, I love traveling, you know, I'm not shy of work, and you know, I jump at every, every opportunity, so, but I always take somebody with me, so, you know, we would sit there together and, you know, you're gradually sort of building this relationship going forwards. But I'm not going anywhere, so I think most of our clients realise that I'm not yeah. sort of, I'm not about to sort of sell up, sell up and sit on the beach. I'm sort of passionate about the business and passionate about our business. Well, you are, you are known for the air miles that you log, <laughs> um, kind of on, or constantly on the move, Joff. Some people say, I mean, you know, a lot of our work colleagues 
would say to me, you know, you, you've got to learn to say no, you know, you should say no, or you should get somebody else to do that. But I actually thrive on it. I love it. And well, that's the part I of the, business, the challenge, yeah. and that's the buzz, you know, to, you know, if you're, if you're sitting in Sydney and you're meant to be in London, you know, tomorrow morning, but somebody wants to see you in Dubai on Tuesday, you know, I'd just say yes. You know, there's no problem with that, as so long as it, planes are flying. Yeah, yeah, it's been a slightly different year. Um, we've talked about some of the, big, the biggest deals you've been involved with. Do you have any? Uh, uh, do you have a, a one that got away story? A big boat that uh, you almost got over the line, but for some reason went wrong. Um, well, there are many of those, of course. You know, for for every do deal you do, there are probably twenty deals that um, that you don't do. And we've just we've just had one. We've just been, you know, on on a quite a big yacht um, and we had a very qualified buyer for that and we'd done sea trials and surveys and deposits sitting in our bank and you know overnight change of mind and um, deposit returned and yes. no deal and and that that's very hard but you know I used to get very very upset about those things and quite sort of anxious when deals fell over now you know, you learn to roll with the punches a bit more um, and so long as you've got the cash in the bank to, you know, you know there will be the, the next deal coming and the next deal coming after that. But, you know, we used to go for very long periods of time without selling a yacht. And so that is quite anxiety making, I suppose. But there are other pillars of the business now, of course, management. Yeah. No, I mean, I think we've got a very solid business and you know, we've got a good cash flow business as well as the sort of roller coaster ride of sale and purchase. And Burgess stands apart a little bit isn't, from the rest of the brokerage community because you have you have salaried staff and of course they have bonuses on top for deals done, etc. Yeah. But you don't work on the commission only basis. No, we don't. No. So every, everybody who works for us is an employee, and everybody earns a salary and get they get benefits. Um, and we try to sort of operate as a team. And we now we've got bigger. We operate as smaller teams within within a team. And it's working very, very well. Um, and I think people actually enjoy being part of, you know, something where there is, there's a future. It's not just about them and them making money. It's about mentoring younger people coming in, having assistance in those deals. You know, some of our senior brokers can rely on more junior brokers to assist them with the deal and to, you know, a bit like having a cook in the kitchen, you know, you've got somebody preparing all the stuff and I've got somebody today doing that for me and the packages will be going out tonight and, you know, I'll look at it in an hour's time and there'll be a couple of tweaks and then out it will go. So, you know, I think it, and if you're not a team player, don't come to Burgess, but, you know, if you want to play in the team and a, and a very successful team, then, you know, we're the guys to... So there's a little, little less dog-eat-dog. <laughs> There's much less dog each dog, and you know we've had we've had brokers and charter brokers join us, yacht managers from some of our competitors, and you know, every morning we have a, a daily newsletter, if you like, or a log that come goes out to everybody in the company, and once a week we have a, a bigger newsletter, and it, it will name every yacht, every price, what what deal we think can be done on that yacht. You know, if a charter has just been cancelled, the name of every client who's just just inquired with us and somebody will chip in and say well I know his brother you know maybe I can help and maybe I can or you know has anyone we I've just heard the deals fallen over on this boat you know has anyone got anybody and everyone's sort of it's very dynamic and interactive and you know the people that have joined us from other companies say you know they've never seen anything like this because most of their brokers will sort of lock the information away and take it home with them because course they want to do the deal themselves they don't want to share that information and have somebody else earn the money from it and so when you um you, you travel a lot you work still incredibly hard but when you do get those rare moments of joff time or family time so what what is a uh, time away from the office what does it mean and where are you typically so time away from the office um i mean i spread my time apart from this year but g generally i spread my time between wh when i'm not traveling i'm either in london monaco or in new york Th those are my sort of office times um but i travel twice a week so sort of mixing that up um 
you're in our house today, in our lovely house in, in Burnham on Crouch. Um, we've got lots of land and we have three dogs and we've got two ponies. We've got two sailboats here, race, sort of race boats and a motor launch and some dinghies and tennis court and swimming Vegetable court. garden. And lovely garden, vegetable garden. Um, and I have three little girls, which I think I mentioned at the beginning. So my wife and my three little girls are very much sort of centre of attention when I'm not working. And you know, whatever we do, we do together. We're lucky we have a lovely sailing boat in the Mediterranean that we use over the summer months. Um, so we're pretty blessed, I have to say. Yeah, yeah, sounds pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> well, just reward for a long career in the business. Yeah, no, we, I mean, yeah, I've loved my career. Never expected it to sort of get to where we are today. And, but now we've got here, you know, now we're here. And that's what I say to everyone who we employ 220 people. Yeah, we've arrived at the starting line, finally. And actually the next 10 years is really going to be, you know, the launch pad of where we could take the business. If you could go back and talk to that kid in Athens who wasn't selling a boat for time, <laughs> what, what, what would you say? Well, I think persistence is the name of the game. And, I, you know, any young person wanting to get into this business, never take no for an answer and keep going back and back and back again. And so, same with a broker on a brokerage deal. Yeah, a client will say, well, I'm not interested in yachting. Well, don't strike him off your list. You know, you've got to approach him from a different angle. And in five years' time, you'll find, yeah, he'll charter a boat from you. And so never, ever take no for an answer. Yeah. Pretty good advice. <laughs> uh, Joff, such an enormous pleasure to spend so much time with you and hear some of those incredible stories from your long career in the super yachting business. Thank you very much. It's been great. Well, thanks for coming. And it's always, you're always welcome here. You know, we love having people here. So uh, next time you're in this area, you must come see us again. Sounds great. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs>